Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com. Once again, we are live here at the 2015 PMI Global Congress in Orlando, Florida. Beautiful Disney World. And I'm sitting here with Neil Witten at the PMI booth. Hello, Neil. Hey, how are you doing, Cornelius? I'm doing very well. How did your presentation go? You basically just walked out the door, right? Oh, they kicked me out. <laughs> it was uh, practically standing room only, and I'm, I'm humbled. So there's a lot of people that have interest in achieving the elusive work-life balance. Wonderful. That is the topic of your presentation. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But my question that I'm asking everybody, and you have twisted it slightly, is what do you see in the future of project management? And you said, you know, why don't you ask me what's the future issue in project management that hasn't been addressed yet? What is it? In my view, there's a big issue that has not been addressed in past years well certainly isn't being addressed well today, and I think it'll be a major issue going into the future. And that is leadership. I think it's very weak. Most PMs don't know what it means to lead. They don't walk into the job. They are business people first and PM second. And they don't necessarily understand that. And they're waiting for somebody else to tell them what to do. But they own every problem on that project, either directly or indirectly. It's the lack of leadership, the initiative, and I think that's what we need to spend more time on. All right. Achieving the elusive work-life balance was the topic of your presentation today. Why this topic? What is interesting about it for you? Well, for me, it's an area that I've wrestled with for most of my adult life. Uh, when I was uh, younger, I worked for a, a major company for 23 years. I would easily be called a workaholic. You don't hear that term much anymore, but I was divorced after 17 years. I did not see it coming. And I'm not saying that having an imbalance in my work-life balance caused the breakup. But let's face it, having a poor work-life balance certainly didn't help any. And this is an area that I talk to literally thousands of people a year in our field, and it keeps coming up. People are overtaxed. Uh, they're being pulled in a lot of different ways. They don't have a personal life, or they don't know how to have a good career without damaging their personal life. Right. And we also want to mention that your presentation, Achieving the Elusive Work-Life Balance, is based on an e-learning course. And sometime in the future, you and I are going to work together to provide a discount code to our listeners here. We'll get back to all of you out there sometime in the future. Now, let's jump into your presentation. Why is work-life balance important? Well, let me first describe my definition of work-life okay. balance because everybody's got a different one. But for purposes of this session here, it's achieving an acceptable harmony between your work life and your personal life. So another way of saying it is achieving integration between your personal life and your career. Uh, it's something that the lines are getting blurred as, as the technology goes on and we find ourselves not being able to disconnect from the job. And a lot of times we're working with people around the world requires us to be up and about at all hours of the day. So it's important that we kind of wrestle this down. And you asked, why is it so important? Stress, burnout. Uh, I, I know people who burnout has caused them to literally hate their jobs and in some cases hate themselves. Now that's pretty heavy and nobody should hate themselves for any reason because we're all works in progress at doing the best we can. But some people, they wake up one day and they say, you know, I'm just not happy with my life. And they're trying to figure out what would help them become happier. So, so what does matter? And that is to create a personally meaningful life that includes two key things that a lot of uh, studies are, are showing about us as humans. And that is we want achievement and we want enjoyment in life. We want to be happy. Achievement and enjoyment, two very important things. And if your life is pulled in so many directions that you're not feeling like you're getting a sense of satisfaction in either direction or any direction, then you're not likely going to be happy in getting that fulfillment. From an achievement point of view, we all want to be part of something. We want to know that we're contributing to something, that someone values us. And then from, uh, from a happiness, enjoyment point of view, 
we want to obviously wake up in the morning and say, you know, I look forward to this day. You sent me your white paper before we got together. I looked at it, and the white paper includes a work-life balance quiz. Of course, we're not going to go through that white paper here and through the quiz right now, but I, I recommend to our listeners, download it from the PMI website. They do make these papers available after the Congress. What will the quiz show me? If one of our listeners decides to do this work-life balance quiz, what will be the result that they get from the quiz? Here's what's going to happen. The quiz has 45 questions. And you, depending on how you respond to each question, when you're all done taking the quiz, you're going to add up a whole bunch of numbers and then divide by the number of questions, and you're going to get what I call a life balance score. That score is going to be somewhere between 0 and 5. If your score is 0 to 2.9, then to me, the result's going to be your life is out of balance, that you need to take significant and immediate action to move towards your desired balance. And delaying making the needed changes will only make things worse. If your score is between 3 and 3.9, then I call that borderline. Now's the time to take action before things have a chance to fester and get further out of control. If your score is between 4 and 5, I consider that good. Your life is in good balance, and you should continue to consciously focus on maintaining that balance because you're probably there because you are consciously doing something about it. So the quiz will help give you a sense of where I view you're at. But I need you to know, this whatever score you get, that isn't the bottom line. Because I developed this assessment instrument based on norms in society. But you could get a low value on this course and still be very happy with your life. You could be that proverbial scientist going after the cure for cancer and working uh, 80, 90, 100 hour weeks and have no family, no relationships or whatever, and be perfectly happy in your life. But when you take my uh, uh, quiz, you're likely going to come out poor. But for most people, I think it will be very, very telling. I think it will nail pretty closely what their real issues are. Right. And of course, if you get a 5.0 on that quiz, please do give Neil and me a call <laughs> and tell us how on earth you do that and how you manage your life, because that's what I would love to achieve. In your presentation, you then have 21 actions you can take in achieving your desired work-life balance that you go through. And we have gone ahead and we have selected a few out of these. And the first one is create a vision for what you would like your life to look like. What is that all about? Well, here's the deal. When you, if you don't know what a vision is, what you really want out of life, it's going to be really hard to be helping you yourself get there. Um, so what I recommend that you do, is, and, and I gave this out in the session that I just gave, I gave out a sample that I put together of a vision. It's a page and a half, two page sample. Uh, I think it's in the white paper as well. And what I ask people to do is tell me what you wish your life would be like if you felt you had great work-life balance throughout the day, from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you put your head on the pillow at night. And it ought to have an integration of family members, perhaps exercising and eating healthy if you're into that. Certainly your work activities, personal chores, special events, downtime for re-energizing yourself. But, but create a image, a vision of what you would like it to be. That's why it's so important. Now you have a springboard, a baseline from which to improve things. All right. Before we move on to the next one, which is set your priorities each day, I just wanted to mention that you probably hear some background noise. People are here setting up tables and all that. Welcome to the Global Congress, where we do our interviews live. So, second action you can take to achieve your desired work-life balance, set your priorities each day. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a big problem that I find. I, I literally uh, work with thousands of people a year. And I would say the majority of them, and they're PM types for the most part, and leaders of different sorts, the majority of them do not know how to manage time. It's very critical you understand how to do that. So I'm going to tell you how to do that right now. When you start your workday, you want to start with a to-do list. Almost everybody already does that. That to-do list, let's say there's 10 items on the list. And for people listening, they probably have a lot more than 10, and that's okay. But for illustrator purposes, I'm going to make it just 10 for here. And you need to identify your top three priorities and the bottom seven. When you go home from work at the end of the day, if you haven't touched any of your top three priorities, but you managed to cross off your bottom seven, 
do not feel good about what you accomplished that day because you worked on the wrong things. We tend to work on the things that are easy or that get instant gratification or they might be fun, but that's not where the focus should be. If instead, when you go home from work at the end of the day, you haven't touched your bottom seven, but you've na- made significant headway and working just one of your top three, you should feel very good about your accomplishments. And here's why. Your career, your contribution, the value you bring to your project, to your organization, to your company is predicated on your ability to manage to your top three priorities each day, not your bottom seven. And let me give you an example why this is so important. The number one reason why projects fail, it's not what everybody tells me. They tell me, you know, the usual suspects are uh, weak requirements, uh, poor estimating, scope creep, uh, communications. Yeah, those are all important, but that's not the number one reason. The reason why projects fail is because PMs don't manage to the top three priorities each day. That's what it is. How do I know that? Because I have reviewed hundreds of projects in trouble. And at the end of those reviews, I always present to the PM the top three things they need to go off and work. And when I sit back and I look at what those three things are, it's very apparent to me that these things should have been worked off not days, but weeks or months ago. And... Because they're not working the most important things, their projects are decaying. They're imploding and they're coming apart at the seams. And that's all in the control of the PM. So going back to the top three priorities, you might say, well, Neil, it sounds like you don't care if I work on my bottom seven. And I really don't. But if you have, say, five minutes between meetings, you want to mark off one of your bottom seven, I don't have a problem with that. But if you have 30 minutes or more between meetings, Do not focus on a bottom seven. Focus on the top three because those are the things that define your job the most. And you want to work off your top three within two or three days, not two or three weeks or two or three months. And how you do that, if you have something in the top three that is going to take you, say, six weeks to solve, then put a six-week plan in place. Identify the activities, the durations of the activities, their dependencies, who owns them. Get agreement from everybody that you need to make this six-week plan whole. And then take that plan and move it into your overall project plan, track it with everything else, take it off your top three list and put something else on that list. That's what you need to do. So um, setting your priorities each day goes a long way, making sure you're working on the most important things so we maximize our productivity. All right. The next item we have chosen here is minimize time in meetings. That's a good one. I'd like to do that. (laughs) Yeah, we all would like to do that. But I'm going to show you some things that really work and they make it, it it can make a difference. You especially want to limit time in unstructured meetings. An unstructured meeting, for example, I'm a consultant. So uh, I've been on my own since 1993 and I've worked, I've been in thousands of meetings. I've worked with hundreds of companies. If I walk into a meeting and it's not clear what the meeting's about, and that's not unusual because they're paying me to help them. I will ask the question, what is the objective of this meeting? And sometimes I hear, actually often I hear, you know, I'm not sure, where somebody will say, oh, well, I think the objective is so-and-so. And And someone else say, no, I don't think it is. I think it's this over here. When that confusion starts occurring, I will say, guys, I don't have time to be here. I am here to help you, but I can't help you if you don't know what it is that we're supposed to work on. I'm going to leave. You work on what the objective is. When you've got it figured out, call the meeting again, and I'll be here to help you. Now, as far as meetings go, there's only two types of meetings that I believe we should attend, and I practice this. The first is, if you need to be in a meeting because there's information in that meeting you need to do your job. The second is, if you have information that others need, then you need to be in that meeting. But let's look at the second case. If you say, It only takes me two or three minutes to deliver that information. You don't want to sit through another 55 minutes plus just to deliver two or three minutes of information. If you're only there to give information, I would not be there. I would either give that information to somebody before the meeting or I would tell the leader of the meeting, tell me what five minutes you want me there and I'll be there. And I've had a number of cases where somebody will say, well, Neil, I don't know what five minutes. I just need you to be there. So I say, you want me to waste 55 minutes of my time in order to be there for five minutes to help you with something. That's not going to happen. And often they'll say, well, then I'm going to go talk to your boss. And I say, I welcome that because that 55 minutes is not my time. It's my boss's time. My job is to make my boss look good. 
And there's no way my boss is ever going to say to you, it's okay to take 55 minutes of his time in order to give five minutes of something that you need. Now, I do not attend meetings out of curiosity. I do not attend meetings that do not fit those two criteria. One other thing, two other things I want to share with you about meetings. Establish meeting buddies. If you and somebody else that you work with have to be in a routine meeting, say weekly or every other day or whatever it is, then trade off. Have that buddy attend for you, represent you, and then after the meeting, tell you what you missed. And then you do the same thing for your buddy in a different meeting so that person doesn't have to go to that meeting. So that's one thing you can do. Another item, which is very, very important, is most of us defy the laws of physics every day. And how we do that is we commit to be in a meeting from 9 to 10 and then another meeting from 10 to 11. So at 10 o'clock, we have to be in two places at the same time. Even if it's in the same conference room, you got a different crowd that has to come and go. If it's a conference call, you still have to get off the call and redial. And there's a law in classical physics that says two objects cannot be in the same place at the same time. And now there's a law in quantum mechanics that says that is possible, but we're not measured no, we're, by we're quantum. We're not that small. Yes. No, we're, <laughs> we're definitely not. So here's what I do. All of my meetings start at 10 minutes after the hour to give you time to get from your last meeting to my meeting, whether it's a conference call or a physical walk. It also gives you time for a bathroom break, to check your email or whatever you need to do. All of my meetings also end 10 minutes or before the end of the hour for the same reason. I don't want you to leave my meeting early to get to your next meeting on time because most meetings are going to start on the hour. And so I have the power as the leader of the meeting that I called to set you up for success. And that's what I'm going to do. So if my meetings start at 10 after the hour, I'm not expecting you to be there at 9 after the hour. I want you to be there at 10 after the hour. You can get there 5 after on the hour. I don't care. But we're going to start at 10 after the hour. So those are things that you can do to help your work-life balance. you got to cut out meetings. you got to make sure that you're focusing your time on the things where you get a sufficient return on investment. Okay. We have two more actions to go. But before we go there... A colleague of mine, Bill Muirhead, he attended your presentation uh, just about an hour ago, I believe it ended. And I asked him, hey, if there's a question that you have for Neil, let me know and I'll ask him in the interview. Now, to, to set this up, my understanding was that in the presentation you talked about the fact, don't work on a weekend if you have to sacrifice your time for the company. Is that about right? No, I never said that. <clears throat> okay, that's, that's how it came I, across to me. I never said me. anything close to that. However, maybe something I said in, was interpreted that way. Yeah. Here's what I would say. We talked about a lot of things. I had 90 minutes to do it, but I could, I could unfold a bigger picture. It's not about if you work weekends or not to me. It's about, are you, is the balance in your life between your personal life and your work life, is it satisfactory to you? So occasionally it may not be. That's not a big deal. But if the long-term uh, uh, direction is not going your direction, then you're going to have to do something about it. Whether or not you work overtime, whether or not you work your weekends, I don't care. That's between you, your boss, your family, whatever. You figure out how to manage that. What I do care about is that you are satisfied overall. No matter how well your work-life balance was in the past, before you heard this podcast, I don't care but I care what it is from this point going forward. I want to help you in any way that I can. And if you made mistakes in the past, you did not have good choices with your work-life balance. So what? Who cares? We're all works in progress. But from this point forward, let's do something about it. So as far as working the weekends, work the weekends. If you're happy doing that, you like doing that, you need to do that for a short period of time, that's fine. So I wish I understood the context better behind that. Right. His question then went on a little further and said, I'm okay working weekends. Sometimes I don't have a problem with that. But how do I tell my boss, you know, I've just worked eight hours on Sunday. Uh, am I going to get these hours back? What is an appropriate discussion to have with your employer about the time that you spend on weekends and then say, well, can I get at least a day off next week? Well, I have a view on that, and it may not be shared by everybody, but I'll throw, throw it out. If you work for me, I, and if you work up to 10 hours a week over time, forever, I don't care. As a professional, I don't think that's too excessive. If you work for me and you don't work any overtime, I still don't care as long as you get your job done. So it's not about the overtime. But if you work for me and you work more than 10 hours a week on a sustained basis, I now care. 
I don't want to burn you out. I don't want to destroy your personal life or whatever. I want to be respectful of your time. So in that regard, if you work more than up to 10 hours a week over time on a sustained basis, I have no problem walking into the boss's office and saying, boss, I would like to take some personal time off to replace in, instead of that time that I worked. Or if it was an emergency, if you had to sacrifice something and you had to work the weekend, I don't have any problem going to your boss and saying, can I take um, this Friday off? Something like that. I want you to be bold. I want you to stick up for yourself. You need to look out for yourself. I have no problem with that. All right. We have two more actions that we want to review you could take in achieving your desired work-life balance, and it is live in your present moment, the now. Yeah, remember, we're talking about your life. We're talking about work-life balance, and um, there's no... Balance is different to all of us because, as I've said, sometimes you're going to put a lot of time in at work because you need to. And other times you don't have to. And you'll uh, focus and give the priority to some things in, in your personal life. Uh, but living in your present moments helps you to be more productive and give more quality. Let me explain. Most people I know do not live in their present moments. They live in the past or they live in the future. Even though we're talking right now, most people I know, when they go to work every day, they're thinking about the things they didn't do, they meant to yesterday or a year ago or 10 years ago. They're feeling regrets. They're feeling guilty over things. They're replaying things if I had to do over again. That takes up cycles of your present moments. And also, most people live in the future. They worry about things. Most things never happen that they worry about. The fact is, there's only one thing that we have, and that's our present moments. The past does not exist and the future doesn't exist. So when you go to work every day, you can concentrate this much. And my hands are uh, one on top of the other with about a foot apart. You have the ability to concentrate that much. But if you go to work and you are feeling guilty of something in the past or worrying about something in the future, it diminishes your depth of concentration. My hands just went six inches apart instead of the full. About a third. Yeah, and, and, the, and the point is now, you're not here in your, full, in, in, in your present moments. Consequently, you're not giving it your best. It's going to take you longer to achieve things. The quality will not be as high. Your productivity will not be as high. So I'm very big at living in your present moments. Okay, and the final one, the one that I chose out of the <laughs> 21 that you had, look at the big picture. Yeah, I'll tell you what this is all about. And this is, uh, this is the last thing of the 21 that I gave in the session that I just gave. The e-learning course actually has 35 in it, and this was derived from there. But the last one that I talked about today was look at the big picture, because it's all about stepping back and looking at your life. You've invested time and energy to create the life that you have. And the question is, are you getting a satisfactory return on that investment? And if you're not, rethink it. For example, let's say you're putting an excessive amount of time at work, your career's doing fine. You're making a lot of money. You have extra money for, uh, for toys outside of work, like muscle cars or maybe a big boats, maybe luxurious vacations if you can never find the time to take a vacation. But frankly, you're not really happy in your life. You're stressed. You feel like you're missing out on the development of yourself. There's no really pause time for you. You might choose instead to cut down some of the time that you're working and cut back on some of the expenses. You may not, you can't have it all. So you may have to give up some things, but in return, you have a more satisfactory life. You have less stress in your life. And by the way, a lot of people think that if you, your work-life balance, if you figure out how to work less hours at work, that you're not going to be as successful at work. But that isn't true. The statistics bear the opposite. Because your productivity goes up, your quality goes up, your enjoyment, you look forward to going to work more when you work and focus more on the things that are most important at work, uh, and, and such as manage to your top three priorities, to free you up now to have more personal time off. All right. My concluding question to you, what are your recommendations for our listeners? What can I do, maybe uh, the first step, the first one to three steps? that they can take in order to achieve this elusive work-life balance that we're all chasing? Well, there's four things that they can do. The first is get a vision. 
for what you want your work-life balance to be like. The second is ask yourself, are you already living that vision? And if you're not, the third thing is, and if you were attending my seminar, there's 21 things that you can use to start moving in that direction. But the third point is to start doing things. They can be small steps or big steps. Mostly small steps are fine, but to incrementally move to where you want to go. And then the last step is revisit this every few months. I have the, a free uh, work-life balance quiz that I'm willing to send or give to anybody, which will assess your work-life balance. And that's those are the four things that you need to do to focus on where you want to be someday. And you will get there. Neil, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Cornelius, so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.